Father, we thank you tonight that you reign. You're holy. You're our God. We thank you that you've called us for such a time as this and that we as a people will understand that we do not need to wait for the future to come. But you've told us the things that will come in the future so that we can prepare in the now for the tomorrow and understand that through your word, your plan and your purpose for us is perfect. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want some worshipers to come back in a few moments. Go if you would with me in the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 2. This is a rather lengthy chapter, and we'll just see um, how far we go. We've been speaking a little bit about the value of faith, and this morning we touched a little on waiting. And we understood that when you have faith and you believe in God, there is a period where you wait. When you plant a seed, there's a period when you wait. And so it's part of life where a promise is made and we wait. And it isn't always possible for the individual who makes the promise to immediately perform on the promise if they're a human being. However, when we look at the Word of God, the Bible says this, my brethren or my brothers or my or family count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. So I want to just hold it there uh, for one second to give you three things. Patience, perseverance, and endurance. These three things, patience, perseverance, and endurance. They all sound similar, but they are all different. So he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and then he continues on from verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now notice James, when he writes, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all, liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, notice when you go through here to the book of James, the Bible says the trying of your faith works patience, and then it says if you need the wisdom to get an answer, you can ask God, and God will give you the wisdom to be able to face the circumstance that you're facing. In the Second World War, a gentleman by the name of Louis Zamperini was flying a B-20 four bomber, and he was shot down out of the sky. If you look at uh, a movie that was made about his life, when you look at Louis Zamperini's life, he had run the Olympics in the 1938, and had set a record for the 5,000 meters, and then he became a pilot in the uh, Air Force, or, and was flying in, towards Japan, and he and his friends were shot down. And when they were shot down, they landed up with a little rubber raft and a little rubber dinghy in the sea, and both a book and a movie have been made about his experiences. And uh, as they were in the water, they discovered all they had was a cup and a little bit of chocolate and not many resources to survive on. And so with the bare minimum, they would endeavor to keep uh, the boat afloat. And after about 27 days, the Japanese found them flo floating in the middle of the ocean and shot up their little rubber raft, which made it worse, and so they used their little cups to throw the water out and managed to survive another 20 days until the Japanese captured them. So they had been in the ocean for 47 days with very little to drink, with a, a, bar, a couple of bars of chocolate and uh, basically no food, and the perception would be that they as individuals will die. But when you read his story, Louis Zamperini brings out one of the things which is significant in our Christian faith, and that's what the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. As long as hope burned in their hearts and they could patiently endure, they were able to survive in the middle of the storm. After being found by the Japanese again after 47 days, they first thought 
that the people who were coming to save them were really the American troops, but in actual fact it was the Japanese. And when the Japanese then captured them out of the raft, they took them to concentration camps. And in those concentration camps, they were exposed to all kinds of torture, and uh, they were separated, and numerous things uh, took place. On one occasion, uh, Louis Zamperini shares how they wanted him to hold this heavy beam, which he did, because he knew if he didn't move the beam, he would be beaten. And living on minimum rations, living in a little shed, living without running water, without proper latrines, without anything, he said in his heart, Vengeance began to grow. Finally, when the U.S. defeated the Japanese, went in and rescued him, he returned to the United States of America. And when he returned to the United States of America, he went to a Billy Graham crusade. And it was in a Billy Graham crusade where he heard about the love of Jesus and he forgave his enemies. And then some years later, he set up an opportunity to meet the camp guards and to tell them what had taken place in his life and that he would forgive him or he would forgive his captors. But the person that had persecuted him the most who was running and hiding, and to all intents and purposes, I don't believe he ever was brought to justice, but was running and hiding, Louis Zamperini had managed to get a hold of the commander of the camp and said, look, you were responsible for all the atrocities in the camp, and I would like to meet you. And he was able to connect to him and uh, say, I'll forgive you, and it's all over. That gentleman never came out of hiding, but the rest of the prison guards and those that had tortured him and those that afflicted him came out of uh, hiding and were, got, went through a process, obviously, in Japanese court and international courts where things were rectified, and Louis Zamperini finally flew back to Japan, and when he flew back to Japan, his greatest joy was to tell them that even though their behavior had been unacceptable, he would forgive them and he loved them, and his greatest joy was to share the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Now, that doesn't sound like a very inspiring story when it comes to faith, but in actual fact, when we look through the Scriptures, the Bible tells us, as Wendy read this morning, that you'll be hated because of your faith. You'll be opposed because of your faith. Not everybody is happy because of your faith. Isn't it amazing while you were drinking in a club and getting a high on weed with your friends that they were good with you? But as soon as your life changed and you allowed Jesus to come into your life and change your life, then your friends suddenly didn't want to be your friends anymore. Now when we come into the house of God, what we discover is that we have to begin to grow in God. And we've spoken about this a few times on Sunday, especially Sunday morning. And I know on Sunday night, I've been speaking to you about end times, and which I'll pick up with you next week. But notice in Romans chapter 5, verse 4, it says, But if we wait for what we do not see, we wait with patience. Now remember, let's put it together. Hebrews 11, for those of you who haven't been here, Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And then I have to understand that if faith is the substance of things hoped for, then I realize that hope is the dream or the vision or the expectation. So for Louis Zamperini, the hope, was that they would be rescued. But it didn't turn out quite the way he expected, and it would take almost three years before they would be rescued. And when we come into the house of God and God gives us a promise, in every promise there is a hope, an expectation of good, but a lot of times we wonder, well, Lord, why isn't it turning out exactly the way uh, it should turn out. Well, let me just help you by going uh, firstly to Romans chapter 5, and we're in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, it says this, and we'll back up um, to verse 1, because it helps us understand the chapter. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into His grace. So it's really important. The Bible says we have access into the presence of a loving God. So 
If you have access, you have everything. Access is so important. Uh, I said a little bit about Rwanda, but one of the things that I didn't say was um, I wasn't invited, it wasn't expected, but I went into the, the Houses of Parliament and the Senate. So I was an uninvited guest. But I happened to be with someone who had access. So access is able to get you into places that no one else can get you in. You understand that in many places you have to have an access card. And how the Bible tells me that when I come to Jesus and I understand him, it says in verse 1, I'm justified, acquitted of guilt, by faith, which means I have peace with God. I don't need to be saying uh, God doesn't love me anymore, but he does. And then he says, by whom we have access, by faith, into his grace or his favor, wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but notice this, it says we glory, and uh, these are the verses that are really difficult. We glory in tribulation. Uh, that when trouble comes into our life, we're able to keep our spirit buoyant and survive. You see, the point of being a believer is not to walk around complaining. The point of being a believer is to understand that the God that we serve and Christ who is in us and the power of the Spirit is more than a match for depression, is more than a match for suicide, is more than a match for poverty, is more than a match for anything you've been through in your family. And uh, the only way that we find this takes place is when we place ourselves firstly in the secret place of the Most High. So if I have access to God the Father, then it means I need to access or use that privilege to take time in my prayer closet, in the Word, to be with Him, and then understand that it is in my place and of conversation with God that I'm able to glory in tribulation. In other words, I'm able to look at my trouble from a different perspective. So many times we can only look from our, tr our trouble from one perspective, and that is the perspective either of the family or someone who complains or what government says. But when you begin to look at it through the eyes of Jesus, and you begin to look at it through what he did at Calvary, and you begin to look at the fact that he destroyed death, hell, and the grave, and you begin to realize that you haven't suffered to the degree that he suffered, and yet he overcame his suffering and came out on the other side. When tribulation comes against your life, this is what the Bible says, tribulation, and these are the words we're touching on tonight, produces perseverance. Patience is simply that. Patience is waiting. So I'm going to leave that verse up for a second, define and separate these words. You know, when your electricity breaks down, you call the electrician, and then what do you do? You wait. Because you're not an electrician. Your plumbing breaks down. What do you do? You wait. That's called patience. Now, patience is not an easy thing to learn. Uh, you go to school to get your children from school and they're running late and you're being patient. In fact, the Bible says that patience, it goes all the way through this till it gets to hope. What God is doing is he's producing character. He's dealing with our behavior. And so your normal behavior might be get irritated, to fly off the handle, to whatever, get wordy, whatever it is, but you find out that your impatience doesn't change anything. How many of you found out that you can become impatient while someone is tire changing the tire on your car and it doesn't matter how impatient you are, the tire will be changed when it will be changed. So you working yourself up emotionally, your blood pressure is going through the roof, you're on your cell phone telling everybody how bad it is, and patience is part of what a believer understands, and it is part of our DNA because the Bible says we have to patiently wait for the return of Jesus, and there is a purpose to it. He delays his return because he wants more people to come to know Jesus. 
So sometimes patience can save your life. Patience can save your life. Because in that moment of rushing, you rush through a stop street or you, you're going to be late and, and, and now you're going to just go uh, an extra 20 k's over the speed limit and that rush of being impatient puts you in a place that is not a good place. And I've had many occasions like that where I, I, I've been, I, I've said to Wendy and, and we're two different people, I say to Wendy, I need to leave, uh, I'm going to go now, I'm going to be late, uh, I'm going to be there on time, I'm very much like that. And uh, that, I, I, that, that's me. When, Wendy, Wendy just moves through time and space. Uh, <laughs> we're just two different people. And so, uh, <laughs> that, that when you get married, you expect to marry someone different from you. And, and her moving through time and space actually works really well for me uh, because my wanting to keep to a regimented, organized, every organized type of lifestyle can drive her insane. And so it kind of mellows me out on the one side. And on the, on the other side, it kind of speeds her up on the other side because she will get there. But the guarantee is if, they, if you've got to be at the airport two hours before time, she'll be there an hour before time and just whew, somehow slip onto the plane. And her father was exactly the same. So it was learned genetically from her dad. So <laughs> her dad, in fact, one day uh, was just so cool, chilled out, so patient. He actually got onto the plane and had the car keys that mom needed to drive home. No problem to dad. He went and knocked on the pilot's door, asked him to please throw the keys out the window and give it to someone on the runway who would go and find mom. And he described what mom looked like from inside the plane. And the pilot threw the keys out the window and took the keys out to mom outside. That's kind of like being really chilled out. Nothing gets you down. Amen. And so we see when we look at the word, word of God, pay. Patience means to do nothing while God is working. Patience is to be content. Patience is to understand that, and when I, when, when I say do nothing, that means I don't try to push the plan of God through that he's promised me. So this is what happens with Abraham and with Sarah. God promises him a child. It's going to take 25 years before the child is born. But in the interim, he decides to sleep with the, his wife's helper. And when he sleeps with his wife's helper, he has a child, and it's not God's plan. And so throughout Scripture, you'll see he rushed the plan of God. And God didn't reject the first child, but he said to him, the child of promise is the child that I told you to wait for, and the child of promise is the one I said I would bless the most. So you'll find scriptures in the Bible that said, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now, if you read that in the King James Version, it sounds like God hates one of the children. But the original language doesn't say that. He says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau I loved less. So when you go through the scriptures, you begin to find, and then when you find Isaac, you'll find throughout the scriptures, you'll find Isaac, the child of promise. And so wherever you go, whether it's, whether it's Jacob, whether it's Esau, whether it's Isaac, you'll find throughout the scriptures when God gives a promise and we don't wait, God doesn't get so mad that he says, okay, you made it happen. What he says, look, you, you, you've got it now. You've got to deal with it. And uh, I, I don't love it as much as the thing that I promised you. That doesn't mean that, that God doesn't, uh, is saying one person's good and one person's bad. But really what he's saying is that good is the enemy of best. And what you did was good, but what I wanted to do is give you my best. And so when we begin to look at patience, we see firstly, James chapter five, where he goes back, it says, knowing that uh, tribulation produces perseverance. And then if we keep reading on, and perseverance, we're just gonna go to verse four, keep going in Romans five, and uh, you'll see that when we go on in the scripture, it says patience, experience, experience hope, and hope makes not ashamed. 
So notice patience and tribulation and all of that come for experience or character. Hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. So hope is that constant expectation in the time of trouble. So when I first look at patience in Romans 5 verse 4, notice the Bible says, but if we wait for what we do not see, we wait with patience in Romans chapter 5 verse 4. But if we wait for what we do not see. Now while you're waiting, it doesn't mean you're passive. You know, if you're waiting at a bus stop, you're fidgeting today, people are on their cell phone, they're doing something. Uh, if you've got nothing to do, read a book. It's the only way to improve your IQ. So I have some people say, well, what am I gonna do? I'm not the smartest knife in the drawer. Read. Amen. <laughs> so if you wanna increase your IQ, read. Read, 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 read. If you're wanting to get a better job, read. Be an avid reader. It's the only way to increase your IQ. It's the only way to increase your vocabulary. And read books that challenge you. Not little magazines, read. Amen. So there's an old saying, readers are leaders. So notice, but if we wait for what we do not see, we wait with patience. Then James 5 verse 6, but also, it says, but let patience, there's a purpose, but let patience establish your hearts in uh, the book of James chapter 5, James chapter 5 verse 6. So firstly, it says we wait for what we don't see. While we don't see it, our heart is being established in James chapter 5, James 5 verse 6. It says that your heart will be established. And uh, maybe I got the wrong verse, it shouldn't be about murder. Um, my bad writing, amen. All right, uh, you can find it for me. It's in James, definitely in James. <laughs> I think we put the wrong verse up. <laughs> Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Oh, it's verse seven, there we go. Um, here, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So notice this, what the Bible says is be patient, and what patience does, it establishes your heart. Now, there's something amazing about the heart. Your self-talk, you speak to yourself about 3,000 words a minute. In other words, even when my mouth isn't moving, my head, you're talking to yourself about 3,000 words a minute. But your heart, speaks to your head more than your head speaks to your heart. So I'll develop that in one of the other messages and it's a well-researched um, university called the University of Heart Math and all they do is they study the communication between the organs of the body and the head. And believe it or not that the organs of the body are not only affected by your thinking, but the organs of the body speak back and communicate to the brain. And your actual physical heart speaks more to your brain than your brain speaks to your heart. There are more communications out of your heart. Now in the Bible, when we talk about the heart, we're talking about the spirit of man. And the only way your self-talk improves is like the Bible says, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, you speak well about yourself. You speak blessing over your life. You speak encouragement to yourself. And as you do that, it becomes part of your DNA where your body speaks back positively to you and not negatively to you. And it's a huge difference. And in many instances, medically, people get healed just because of the attitude. Just because of, 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 of the attitude, the internal attitude. Some individuals will just believe the worst, think the worst, say the worst. It doesn't matter what you say to them, you can't get them out of it. But when you change the way you think, you're renewed in your mind, you're filled with the Spirit, you begin to talk words of faith, it affects your heart, now, the universities are saying, well, you know, your heart speaks to your head more than your head to your heart. Well, that, that's fascinating because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It doesn't say out of the abundance of the brain, the mouth speaks. 
So it says, out of the abundance of what's on the inside of you, you speak. So if on the inside of you, you're filled with hurt, that's what you speak. And what it does is it exacerbates the hurt. And if on the inside of you, you're filled with resentment and you're filled with all kinds of things, that's what's in you and it's like a pollutant and it begins to come out of you and it's not only polluting your physical body, but it's actually polluting every area of you. So Hebrews chapter um, 10 verse 35 to 38 tells me how to establish it. So here the Bible says, when I'm walking in patience, it says, don't cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Notice this, for you have a need of endurance. So we're stepping through to the next word. After you're patient, you have a need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you receive the promise Endurance is that ability to keep going when nobody else will keep going. Endurance is that ability where even if you have a broken ankle, you're going to keep running. When you look at endurance races or great athletes, most of them at some time have been injured, but they kept playing so that they could be champions. And you'll find that that's why the Bible says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. You see, this Christian life is not a sprint. It's an endurance race. It's like the Comrades Marathon, the two oceans. It's just, you get up, and uh, a lot of times people will say, well, how do you run a long distance race? It's about how many miles you've got on your legs, not how many miles you've got in your head. So when you're practicing for an endurance race, you're going to get up, And you're going to, if you've never run before, you're going to walk to begin to get fit. And then from walking, you're going to begin to jog slowly. And then uh, from there, you're going to increase your pace over a given distance. And as you increase that pace, not only is the body growing in lung capacity and in other areas, but, you know, your stamina is growing, you'll begin to find that the further you go, the more pain is incurred, and they have uh, in running and in sports a thing called a pain barrier. And there's at least two of them. You'll at least go through one and then a second one. And there's a point where the body will just begin to function mechanically even though it is in pain. And so we realize when Paul said, I have run my race, that this Christian walk of ours is not only about impatience, but it's about endurance. It's about hanging in there when you feel bad, hanging in there when you haven't heard from heaven, hanging in there when you go, (laughs) how much worse can things get? It's based on the fact that I know, firstly, that I'm unconditionally loved. I know I have access to the Father and grace is made available to me. And I recognize in the world there's tribulation, there's opposition, there's persecution, there's all kinds of things. Jesus said we're in the world but not of the world, and the world because of the spiritual forces in the world, the demonic spiritual forces in the earth. This is why Scripture says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. So a lot of times we think we're dealing with a person and we're actually dealing with Darth Vader. We're dealing with dark forces. We're dealing with broken hearts. We're dealing with generational curses. We're dealing with an atmosphere that is behind the motivation of the individual, the family, or the neighborhood. And when we recognize that we can overcome that, it takes perseverance. So if you're not exercising, the first thing you've got to do is get off your bed. The second thing you've got to do is determine a time where you're going to walk. The same as prayer. Prayer is just like a muscle. Your prayer life has to be built. And it's going to require perseverance. In other words, a persistent ability to live the dream and live in the purpose that God has given you. And sometimes you're not going to get there immediately. You're only going to get there by making small incremental changes. Many times we're trying to make these big changes. And people get out of bed tomorrow. I'm going to go on a diet. And the change is so drastic, you can't eat the food. 
So what you have to do is make a small incremental change. So you might say, look, the bread is bad. So I'm going to change from white bread to seed bread. And I'm going to limit myself to two loaves. But you have to make changes. And then in those changes, there has to be accountability. My wife, together with some of the ladies here in the church, they weigh in every week. So I said to her, why do you weigh in every week? She said, to be accountable for my weight. Because when you're accountable one to another, then the person with you uh, cheers you on. And and if you're a little over, another person's a little under, they say, come on, you can do better. Because you're going to need somebody to cheer you on in the place of perseverance. You're going to need people around you who encourage you to move forward. You don't want the group like Joseph had in Genesis chapter 37, verse 5 and 9, where it says, Joseph dreamt a dream. We talk about perseverance, and his brothers hated him. In Genesis chapter 30, 37, rather, verse 5, and then verse 9, in Genesis 37, verse 5, it says, Now, Joseph had not told the dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him. When you have a destiny and a dream, and uh, you're moving towards that dream, and you're patiently stepping towards it, it's gonna require endurance because the more you share the dream, the more people oppose the dream. Let me tell you, no one is excited about you succeeding in business. No one's excited about you getting your dream car. (laughs) Not people who have a heart that is dark or their heart is greedy or their heart says, why have they got that and I don't have it? And if you're going to be affected by the critics, you will never succeed. Critics may tell you things you don't wanna hear and may tell you some things that are true, and it's not bad to have critics, but when you allow your critics to determine your future, then you're in a bad place. You have to allow the word of God to determine your future. So when Joseph's brothers, Joseph has a dream and his brothers hate him, what happens in verse nine is he just dreams again. So if people didn't like your first dream, just dream a bigger dream. If people didn't like the first thing you spoke about, it says then then he dreamed. Still another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Now they changed his name. They stopped calling him Joseph. They said, look, the dreamer is coming. And one of the things that keeps us going is keeping the dream that God has put alive in our heart. That is the hope that is set before us, because it's the dream that releases the hope. Of course, now when you go all the way through the story of Joseph, you find eventually that his life looks like it's downhill after he starts having a dream that he's gonna be promoted. Everything that happens is demoted. His brothers sell him into slavery. He gets accused of grabbing another man's wife. He gets thrown into prison. Uh, All types of things happen. But then it all turns around and he becomes the vice president of a nation. Because there's a time for the dream, there's a time for the promise to come to pass. The book of Ecclesiastes is clear. It says for everything there is a time and there is a season. And so you want God to release the promise at the right time and in the right season. So we've, we've looked at patience, we've looked a little bit at, endu- at, at perseverance. Now I wanna look up at endurance. So when we look at perseverance, it means just persist, keep the dream alive. And then endurance, and this is just where the Bible gives us three different views in the Greek language of the same word in waiting. Endurance means to hold up against all odds. The scripture says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so um, perseverance is the ability to keep going in a long endurance race. Patience is the ability to realize that things are not going to work out immediately. The trying of your faith works patience. So whenever you pray People said, well, when we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. What's gonna happen, as soon as you pray that prayer, we're simply saying, God, you're our Father. 
you're in heaven. Your kingdom come. When we begin to pray and we begin to say, Lord, we want what is in heaven on earth, there is opposition on earth because God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He has blessings for you. He has things he wants to release to you. And as soon as we say, Father, give us, you have an enemy force on the earth that says don't give them. And that's where we have to be patient. We see that in the book of Daniel. Daniel begins to pray. God sends an answer, and he's patient for 21 days in fasting and in prayer because the answer doesn't come. But he believes, and he doesn't know that the angel is on its way. And then when he meets the angel, the angel said, I left to try and get you the answer, but there was a fight that went on in heaven. So when that fight was going on, it required something. It required uh, on earth to, for Daniel to hang in there and to persevere in the 21 days of prayer, but it was going to also require endurance after the word of the Lord came to him. The same applied to the angel. The angel was gonna have to persevere to win the battle that was in the heavenlies. And he was going to have to have the strength to endure in the time of conflict. And the angel endures the conflict, comes to Daniel, then tells Daniel the history of the earth that we're living in, the things that are going to happen at the end of the world, and it's literally the days that we're living in. And he says, Daniel, you're going to shut up the book, and it'll be open to people in the last days. So he's speaking to Daniel thousands of years ago, and he literally tells him how the kingdoms of this earth will be set up. He shows him, he talks to him about the Babylonian Empire, and he talks to him about the Roman Empire, and I'm not going to go through everything he talks to him about. He talks to him about the current thing that we see with the EU and NATO, and that's all in the Scripture. And he talks to Daniel, and he says to him, thousands of years ago, when none of these things exist, and Daniel has to take what God says to him, write it down. He doesn't even get to see it come to pass, but he puts it down, and he, in his own day, he outlives three kings as a prophet. And in outliving three kings, he has to have faith in the word of God to recognize that God has given him a promise, and he won't back down on that promise. So it takes, as Wendy said this morning, more faith to wait so that God can act while we wait. Would you stand with me tonight? We're going to pray together. As we stand together, I'm reminded how Moses waited 40 years in the wilderness before God brought him back. I heard a gentleman say, well, are you a pessimist? or an optimist? <laughs> and then another gentleman responded by saying, I'm a realist. As a realist, we acknowledge where we are. As a pessimist, everything gets worse. As an optimist, we say everything's getting better. We have to understand that God's word can be looked at pessimistically, where we can say it's just getting worse and there's no good news. And that's true. The Bible says the world will become darker and darker and more wicked and more wicked. But it says the righteous, which is on the optimistic side, will become brighter and brighter and brighter. On the wicked side, it says the wicked will begin to destroy themselves. But on the righteous side, it says God will protect the righteous even when the wicked are destroying themselves. That's why the scripture says, though a host encamps around me or a whole army is surrounding me, I will not be afraid. We cannot allow, if you pick up a newspaper, every newspaper is pessimistic. There's no good news in any newspaper. When last did you pick up a newspaper and there was a good story about something that changed? Very seldom. Because the newspapers are based on selling 
the bad news. That's how they make their money. Now we're in a slightly different news cycle now. We're in a little bit more of a reality news cycle phase at the moment. But newspapers in essence, look at any poster tomorrow morning, it'll be something negative. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. But we who take a hold of the word of God look at that and say that's a challenge and we're going to go and wait in the Lord and we're going to endure be patient and our end result when you get to the book of Revelation the whole book of Revelation says to him that overcomes 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 the book of Revelation isn't this negative book about this bad antichrist that comes into the world and the poor little Christians are so scared they have to run away. When you open the book of Revelation at chapter one, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, it says, this is a book that reveals Jesus and everything that Jesus did and everything that Jesus was and everything that Jesus accomplished and is accomplished is to overcome in the most impossible circumstances. So I wanna pray for each and every one of you tonight. In every circumstance that was impossible, they had to wait to multiply the loaves and fishes. The man who was lowered through the roof who was paralyzed, they had to wait to get him to Jesus. The leper, who came to Jesus could have been stoned. The man whose daughter was dead and he said, come and heal my daughter. He had to wait for Jesus to get to his house. And Jesus just looked at him and said, I will come and heal your child. I'm coming. But humanly, the man knew my daughter is at home desperately ill, about to die. Humanly, our human emotions and our mind begin to push in on us and say, there is no hope. You're not gonna make it. But when we grab a hold of the Word of God and you get into your prayer closet, everything that God has said to you, He will bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Let's sing this little song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. place tonight and we sing this song turning our eyes is Ephesians talks about the eyes of our understanding our natural eyes it's amazing that when we close these eyes we're still able to see with the eyes of our heart the eyes of our the world would call it our imagination but it's the eyes of our spirit man it's the eyes of the born again man. It's the eyes of the spirit filled man. I was asked a question one day and they said, Pastor Nev, if you're preparing for a healing service, how do you prepare? And I said, normally my eyes will be closed and I'll be worshiping it. And I see the people in church and I see the disease and I see what's wrong with them here. And I see Jesus touching them. And they said to me, when someone said to me, well, 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 what do you mean you see them? I said, well, at first sometimes, just like the Bible says, we see through a glass darkly or through dark glasses because the light isn't good. I said, sometimes because in me, as a person, I can't see it. I can't see how God's going to do it. I have to just wait a little longer in His presence. Because as I wait, and I wait in scripture, and I wait in worship, and I wait in time alone, 
I begin to see that with God all things are possible. And on the inside of me, it doesn't become a I hope so or a fearful thing or I have to pray a long prayer. It just becomes on the inside of me. I, I, I've seen it. I know this is God, but it comes through patiently enduring. It comes through hanging in there. And as long as I can't see the God of heaven doing it, as long as all I can see is the chaos around me, it's very difficult to see the order. Because God always steps in a chaos and brings order. God always steps in a chaos and brings order. Now the secular world says something completely different. The secular world says something completely different. That chaos causes people to push towards a goal. That's what the secular world says. That's what human sociology and psychology say. But the Bible says that God steps into chaos. And out of chaos, He brings order. He brings order. So wherever there's a disorder in your life tonight, and we sing this, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full into His wonderful face. Whether it's chaos intellectually, chaos emotionally, chaos in your family. As soon as Jesus stepped into any kind of chaos, whether it was a storm on a boat, whether it was a rioting crowd, he brought order into that crowd. And the Holy Ghost, when he steps into things, brings divine order. You'll say, what is divine order, Pastor Nick? It's called the kingdom of God. Righteousness, relationships are right, peace and joy. And it's that righteousness, peace, and joy that when we hit a storm, we can joy in the storm. We can wait in the storm. We can be uh, victorious in a storm because uh, there's a king living in our heart, the king of peace, the king of relationships, the king of joy. And so even when we should be crying, we can be joyful. Even when we should be afraid, we can be peaceful. Even when relationships should be totally ruined, we know that God mends broken relationships. So as we sing that song tonight, I want you just to sing it to Jesus. And wherever there's been chaos or disorder in your life, I want you just to let Jesus step into your heart and bring order to your life. So turn your eyes so Turn your eyes on him and turn, turn your, your eyes upon Jesus. And the things of the earth. place and wherever you are you say Pastor Nev my heart isn't right with Jesus I can see how the enemy has come in and I've been frustrated and I've lost patience and I've given up and I just don't feel that life is worth living anymore I feel there is no hope but the Bible says there is a hope in your future right where you stand tonight you say Pastor Nev I need Jesus to step into my heart and life. I need Jesus to change my life. I need to know that he's my Lord. I need to know that he's my Savior. And tonight, 
regardless of what's been happening, I've walked away from him. But tonight I'm turning back to Jesus. I'm coming back to Jesus. Right where you are, as we're in this place, I want you just to bow your heads and we're going to pray together and with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Say, Pastor Nick, pray for me. Then I want you just to quickly raise your hand right where you are. I'll see your hand and I'll pray for you right where you are. Say, pray for me wherever you are. I'll see your hand. There are others. Just pop your hand up, pop it down. It's not to embarrass you. I see your hand. There are others way in the back. I see your hand. There are others. Just pop your hand up. Put it down again wherever you are. Just pop your hand up. Put it down again. Say, Pastor Nev, I'm walking out of this chaos. Some of you might have known Jesus. Some of you have turned your back on Jesus. Some walked away from Jesus. But you say, tonight, I'm coming back to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to take another step. And I don't know this is a brave step. But you raised your hand. Maybe you didn't raise your hand. You may be on your own standing next to somebody. But I'm going to ask you to come and join me in front for prayer. And we're going to sing this little song again. Turn your eyes on Jesus. And from wherever you are, if you're on your own, ask someone to walk with you. If, if, you, if you just say it doesn't really matter, I'm coming anyway. I want you to join me from the back and the sides and the middle. Come and join me here in front for prayer. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just come and join me here in front for prayer. And we're going to pray together with you as we sing this song. And turn. Just quickly come from wherever you were. Over here in the middle, across on the sides. Even if you didn't raise your hand, there are others. Just come quickly and there'll be someone here to meet with you. Just come quickly from wherever you are. There are others who didn't raise your hand. Just come from wherever you are. And the things of the earth. Just quickly come from wherever you are. In the light. just standing with me in front just to pray this prayer and say Father Father tonight I come to you and I thank you that you are the one who quiets the storm I thank you you know everything I've faced and everything that I've gone through tonight as I stand in this place I thank you that you speak peace to every storm in my life. I thank you that I am forgiven, washed in your blood, your child. Tonight, my life changes forever. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask the musicians to sing, and those of you who are here praying with me, Please ask the person exactly what is wrong and please get their phone number. And uh, I know this is just going to be an online training course right here. When we pray, release your faith. It's not a counseling session. Amen. Rebuke the devil where you need to rebuke the devil. Pray the prayer of faith, which means be healed. So sometimes we're praying ourselves in unbelief. Don't pray yourself in unbelief. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good advice for everyone in the church. You come to my pastoral class. I'll help you. Amen. <laughs> Would you agree with me in prayer? Let's go ahead and just talk to each person and pray with them.
violence in our nation needs to come to an end. It needs to come to an end. Sometimes you may hear me when I speak and whether I'm speaking in this nation, if I'm speaking in another nation where people have the right to bear arms, you have to understand the nation and the reasoning behind certain things. Why certain governments have certain things in place and how the founding fathers put it together otherwise you'll misjudge a nation politically because you don't understand its history but one of the things that you need to be aware of before a nation can be taken over and its citizens can be subjugated they must be disarmed they must be disarmed Stalin did it Mao Zedong did it, Hitler did it. Now that doesn't mean I'm telling you to all go out tomorrow and buy a gun, okay? And when a nation is disarmed, generally, arms are still in the nation and they're sold to criminals. And a lot of those arms are flowing from the people who have the guns, which are the police departments and the defense force. They actually, they're the people that have the guns. They land up being sold on what we would call uh, an illicit market. And so I believe that we need to pray, just like we pray against drugs and everything else, that God will shut down these areas. And I, I hear every nation in the world, people are saying we need to buy more arms, we need to buy more arms, we need to buy more arms to protect ourselves. One of the great writers wrote that no nation has ever amassed arms without planning to use them. And so I don't always quote the various individuals, but I believe we need to pray and rebuke that. Father, we rebuke the spirit of violence that will come against our nation and against our city with drugs, with gangs carrying weapons, we thank you that you'll expose the traffickers. You'll expose those that bring the arms in. You'll expose those in government whose weapons go missing or trade or traffic in weapons. You'll expose wicked men who just for riches want to sell violence to the world. And we thank you, Father, that in this nation, the peace of God will be the referee in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. And the people of God said, Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead.